Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Klaus Dowie Dijkstra, uh, K-L-A-A-S-D-O-U-W-E-D-I-J-K-S-T-R-A. He was born in the Netherlands but grew up in Egypt, drawing and describing his first dragonflies when he was 12 years old. Finding the Netherlands' first vagrant emperor dragonfly, an African visitor, focused his passion when he was 20. He since spent over a thousand days surveying dragonflies all over Africa and has described 78 species as new, over 10% of those known on the continent. 60 species were described in one paper in 2015 to draw attention to the lack of support for taxonomy and natural history. He authored the highly successful Field Guide to the Dragonflies of Britain and Europe, 2006, The Dragonflies and Damselflies of Eastern Africa, Handbook for All Odonata from Sudan to Zimbabwe, 2014, and is an honorary research associate at the Naturalis Biodiversity Center of the Netherlands and the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa. He says, I love this, for me, dragonflies and damselflies stand for our unconditional love of nature. They do not help to feed us like bees and fish do. They are not feared and persecuted like mosquitoes and snakes, nor are they studied as proxies of human psyche and society like ants and apes. Their beauty and sensitivity stand for the state and needs of nature before our own. We admire dragonflies purely for what they are. So first, thank you for, for, for your work and thank you for your love of dragonflies. And second, thank you for being on the program. Well, thank you for having me. So let's start by just talking about who and what dragonflies are. Um, so what, I, I think we're all sort of familiar with them, but can you talk more about, about them generically? Yeah, so uh, dragonflies and damselflies are a group of insects. Uh, there are about 6,000 species, 3,000 of those are dragonflies, 3,000 of those are damselflies. And they're uh, an order of insects uh, found only uh, by freshwater. So all of them have larvae that need freshwater to survive and that emerge from the water as adults uh, to reproduce. So I think that is, is basically uh, yeah, the essence of dragonflies. And um, my, I live right next to a pond and I, I get in the pond all the time. I look at the pond and there's... I see dragonfly larvae all the time and, and see dragonfly adults. And so can you tell me, like, my understanding is that dragonfly larvae can live for a long time. And I guess they're not called larvae, but dragonfly babies can live for a long time underwater and then they live for a, a fairly short time out of water. Is that correct? Uh, not entirely. So uh, we, we call them larvae. Typically, some people call them nymphs. And how a dragonfly develops its... Uh, comes from from an egg and then the larva uh, to grow needs to shed its skin several times just like a, a snake would so it can expand and it'll do that uh, perhaps well 10 times it varies a bit and eventually the dragonfly or actually the larva will come out of the water shed its skin one more time and then the adult dragonfly so the winged creature is already packed inside that larva so all it needs to do is shed its skin pump it up its body pump up its wings and harden out a little bit and and fly away so there's not a, a pupil stage as there is for example in in butterflies now people very often ask how long you know does a dragonfly live for and that really depends very much on the species and you really have to look at it separately you have to look at the at how long the larva lives and you have to look how long the adult lives because some species, for example, live in very cold water where there's almost nothing to eat. So they may use years and years to become so large that they can emerge and fly away as a dragonfly. So they may live as a larva for several years, maybe five years. Other species are adapted to very seasonal conditions. So, for example, they breed in a rain puddle that will dry up in a few months' time. So they can maybe just take four weeks to develop as a larva. So there's a big difference there. And it's the same with the adults. Some species, they uh, emerge, let's say, somewhere in late summer uh, uh, in, in, in the north. So it's going to be a short summer. They need to get on with business, reproduce as quickly as possible. So a, a few weeks is the maximum. Whereas other species that, again, live, for example, in very seasonal environments, they may, may need to wait for another year before it rains again. And so actually have to live for a year until that happens. So um, on, on the whole, you can say perhaps the average dragonfly lives for one or two years as a larva and then for a few weeks as adults, but there's a lot of variation. And 
I, I, I remember reading somewhere, I don't know if this is true, but I remember reading somewhere about how some dragonflies um, migrate. Do they do, do... And once again, we're describing a huge variation of, of creatures, but do... First, what is the range of, once again, typical, using that word advisedly, uh, what is the range of many dragonflies and individuals? And then also, do some of them have migrations? Yes. So the, the range, again, is incredible. So some species are found only on in one river system, one stream system, one mountain range. Other species are found almost all over the world. Wherever there is fresh water on the planet, uh, you will find dragonflies. And there's one species in particular which is known as the wandering glider or also known as the globe skimmer, which can be found in standing waters, temporary waters like rain puddles in almost every continent. It's even found on Easter Island. The only place actually that it's not occurring is Antarctica and most of Europe for some reason. And that is uh, the species that migrates uh, in a spectacular way. That species migrates annually uh, across the Indian Ocean. And this happens because once the monsoons are over in India, there is no more, there are no, no more puddles. They've all dried up for it to reproduce in. And this species needs to cross over to the other uh, half of the Earth, to the other hemisphere, where it will be summer in half a year's time. To, uh, to again profit from the monsoons, but it can't go anywhere because south of India, there's just ocean. So to, f to complete the cycle, to find new habitat to breed in, that species actually needs to cross the Indian Ocean to Africa. And there, the, the new generation will, will breed in the, pool, in the pools there. And once it's time, once they've emerged, they have the same problem, so they either will have to migrate north to the other side of Africa to reproduce there, or migrate over to India. So, And there are other species that, that migrate, perhaps not in such a spectacular fashion, because this is probably the most spectacular migration um, among insects, but uh, there are quite a few species that, that can fly very far, and quite a few species have large ranges. So when you, when you... Okay, where I live in far northern California on the coast... There is a goose, the Aleutian goose, who will fly nonstop from here up to the Aleutian Islands. And it's an extraordinary migration in terms of flying continuously for about two weeks. Um, obviously, they can't. there's no place for them to stop and rest. And when you tell me about that migration right there, that makes, in my mind, that makes, that's way more strenuous than the Aleutian geese migration because these are tiny little creatures. And they're flying how many miles about? Um, so I, actually, I wouldn't even know the exact uh, distance. Um, but yeah, we're talking about a couple of a couple thousand uh, kilometers that they need to, to cross the open ocean. And uh, the calculations are that they can cover the distance in about six days. And that sounds incredibly fast. And that is because they have help. So the period that they need to cross over from India to Africa is a period of favorable winds. So they actually, um, and this is all actually based on circumstantial evidence, because the thing is they are so small that it's actually very difficult. You, you, with, the, with the geese, for example, you can use radar to, to see where they're moving. But with these insects, you can't. So this is based on uh, observations of stragglers, uh, showing up on islands in between and the timing of that, which suggests that these migrations happen. But the thing is that it happens exactly then when the weather system is perfect, so when they have the winds in the back. And the other thing is, although they are small, they are light, and they're well-equipped. They have, they're extremely good flyers. So probably they don't even need to use too much energy to make this crossing because they have the support from the wind they are extremely effective gliders, and so probably it's not as spectacular as, uh, you know, from our perspective as, as earthbound creatures, uh, as it might seem. Nonetheless, this whenever I hear something like this, it always, um, the, uh, just the, the, the way the natural world works always, um, fills me with awe 
I mean, it's it's just of course, it's just, yeah. it's just wonderful how that that all works and they 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 glide on the winds. It's really beautiful. Um, yeah. Go ahead. You know, I was just saying that's the beauty of adaptation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so before we talk about threats to dragonflies or, or long term population trends in dragonflies, um, can we talk for just a moment about dragonflies in the um, in the far, far, far distant past, because weren't there at one point in the history of the planet um, gigantic dragonflies? Yes. So um, about 250, 300 million years ago, there were uh, dragonflies that had wingspans of perhaps two feet. And uh, these were, I mean... They looked generally like a dragonfly, so they had the long wings, they had the long body, but they were not closely related to the dragonflies that we we have now. So we, we don't even know exactly how they fit in the evolutionary tree of the dragonflies. They're quite different, but they're definitely they're definitely dragonflies. We do know though that you know those were very different times. Uh, oxygen levels uh, were much uh, higher in the atmosphere at the time, which uh, might make it easier for. Um, Oxygen to be transported through the through the bodies of an, ins, uh, an insect that actually makes it possible for an insect to get so large, and another factor is that there were, probably weren't uh, large predators uh, at the time, uh, such as uh, pterodactyls and you know pterosaurs, uh, birds and, and such. So there was also actually a niche um, that w was available to them that to them then that's not available to them now so yeah you have to keep in mind these were very different uh, they, they were gigantic they were spectacular but they were quite different from the dragonflies the equally spectacular dragonflies we see today and uh, in, a, in a very different time as well than we have today so also before we talk about trends in dragonflies can you talk a little bit about um, their um ability to just just some of the amazing things about them such as such as their their vision their ability to concentrate and focus on one creature and their ability to predict where that creature's movement movements are taking them etc well i mean probably the most amazing thing about dragonflies is their flight so it's their um just their ability to maneuver in flight the amazing thing is that uh, dragonflies are definitely among, uh, you know, one of the, the oldest groups uh, of, of, of flying insects. Uh, the other group is, is the mayflies, which are actually very weak flyers. Um, but, but most insects that, that fly, that we're familiar with, evolved later. But still, the amazing thing is actually that the dragonflies are the best flyers of them all. So it, in a way, the the way of flying that dragonflies have, have developed has never been improved. And one of the things that is very unusual uh, about dragonflies and that you don't see in other insect groups is that dragonflies have the ability to... They have four wings, so two pairs of wings, like, like all insects do. But unlike uh, most insects, they can actually move all four wings independently. So uh, in most dragonflies, in most insects, they will use... Um, like they will be flopping with... with uh, synchronously, like like butterflies do, for example, but dragonflies can move the four in, independently, which means that they can do anything that they desire. They can they can stand still, they can fly backwards, up and down. So they have this incredible maneuverability, and of course that is very important because all dragonflies are predators. So all of them hunt uh, other animals, uh, mostly mostly other insects, and. To intercept those, they need the maneuverability, and of course, they need really good vision because they're visual hunters. So they combine this incredible uh, capacity of flight with uh, a very, very uh, large uh, um, and very acute eyes. An eye of a dragonfly can have about uh, 29,000 omatidia, which is you know all the facets that, that an insect eye has. Uh, which together each each facet is like a pixel of the, of, the, of a picture, which together forms uh, an image. Uh, we've also found out recently that dragonflies have about seven color receptors uh, in their eyes, whereas humans have uh, only three. We don't know if all seven, you know, make also a much more colorful image, but we do know that possibly their um, their color vision is better than ours. So. Yeah, these are really the two things that are extremely well developed in dragonflies. 
I know you just said that we don't know really what it means, but I'm I'm interested in the thing about the seven color receptors because I used to be a beekeeper, and so I know that honeybees, for example, um, see red as black. They don't see infrared, and they do see ultraviolet. So the world looks completely different to them. Does does the fact that they have seven color receptors that mean that that it would just be more vivid, or does that mean that they see the world really completely differently? I think we haven't actually figured that one out yet. At least I don't know. I can't answer the question. So either I haven't read my literature properly, or we just haven't gotten that far yet. Hmm. That's once again, it's just extraordinary to me. Your your line about about adaptation. I mean, the, the world is just is just extraordinary. Um, okay, I want to go a different direction now. And several years ago, there was a dragonfly expert came and gave a talk here locally, and um, probably the most the, the question that was most that most of the people in the audience wanted to know is why are there fewer dragonflies and than there than there used to be. And I, I've lived here for seventeen or eighteen years now, and in this time I have seen a dramatic decline in the population of dragonflies here. Probably it used to be on a on a warm summer day I might go out and see at any time over the pond I would see a hundred dragonflies. And now on a warm summer day I might see ten or fifteen or twenty. And um, is this just local or is this happening across the world? Again, we actually have very little data. So you, you often hear th these kind of stories and, and people do say, yeah, I'm seeing less, I'm, I'm seeing fewer dragonflies than I did uh, in my childhood. But the truth is that we actually have very little data to, to substantiate that. The problem there is that you know, of course, you can anecdotally, you know, observe that the numbers have declined, but only recently have dragonflies become so popular that actually we have uh, the amount of volunteers that can go out and actually observe dragonflies, actually count dragonflies, and and see what the what the trends are. And then actually we see uh, again a very a very complicated uh, picture. For example, in in the Netherlands where I'm from, I, I live in South Africa at the moment. But in the Netherlands where I'm from, actually a lot of species are increasing, and actually a lot of species are profiting uh, uh, from from global warming. So you 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 know if you if you then kept uh, kept your vision very narrow, some people might say, oh well, you know, dragonflies they like warm a warm climate, so actually they're 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 benefiting and it's true some species for example species that are from africa these tropical species they will profit and because they're good dispersers they will ex extend and their numbers will increase in europe but we see other species for example those of 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 bogs you know which is a boreal habitat which dry out easily um, that are affected negatively and the numbers are declining. Uh, where we really see uh, dragonflies uh, suffering is in standing waters. Uh, sorry, not in standing waters, in flowing waters. So typically uh, the species of streams and rivers are, are much more sensitive. Uh, they're often also much more localized uh, species. And such species are very easily affected uh, by erosion, uh, by damming, because of course a dam will uh, turn uh, a stream into a, uh, into a lake. So that completely changes the environment, uh, the removal of uh, natural vegetation or the development of alien vegetation, which may shade out a habitat, uh, the introduction of trout in many areas where it's not native. Uh, trout are predatory fish. So that can uh, affect the dragonflies. So there are there are multiple multiple reasons why dragonflies uh, decline, but the biggest problem in general, as for almost all uh, threatened species, is habitat destruction. So it's um, the changing uh, of river courses. So it's damming, it's uh, canalizing um, river system, it's draining ponds, it's draining marshes, wetlands. Um, so the general destruction of freshwater habitats. And how sensitive are dragonflies to uh, pollutants in the water? Um, they tend to be, uh, on the one hand, dragonflies are top predators. So on the one hand, you have, uh, you know, they're at the top of, uh, of, of, um, of the food chain, often in the, the environments that they inhabit. So on the one hand, that means, of course, that... Um, 
uh, the pollutants will accumulate in dragonflies. On the other hand, that does mean also that they need to be adapted to some degree to pollution. So we see with dragonflies that they uh, they can be sensitive um, to chemical pollution, uh, but some uh, other groups uh, in freshwater, such as, for example, mayflies and caddisflies, they are actually even more sensitive to to to, dra- to uh, this kind of pollution. What dragonflies, on the other hand, are extremely sensitive to is structural habitat change. So it's changing the clarity of the water, for example, changing the the substrate, so from a sandy substrate to a muddy substrate, for example, and all these kind of uh, changes that um, are influenced by by human actions, like like damming, like erosion, like agriculture, uh, like the the removal of vegetation. These are the kind of things dragonflies um, respond very, very sensitively to. So... Uh, this raises a couple questions, and, and I'm sorry if a lot of these questions are so basic, but I mean, I love dragonflies, and I, I don't know them, so I'm presuming audience members won't know either. Um, are, are larvae, um, do they, how do they hunt? Do they, I've seen them hunt, but are they visual also, or, or, how, or how do they detect prey? So uh, mostly it's, um, it's visual and it's tactile. So it depends, again, a bit on the species. So if you are a species that is crawling around in, in water plants, then you can imagine that you know the water is clear around you and you're mostly a, vis- a visual uh, hunter. If you are digging in the mud, there's not much to see anyway because you're, you're stuck with your head in the mud. So then uh, a tactile strategy, like looking for little uh, worms, for example, uh, in the mud, Will, will be better. So that, again, depends on the species. And also, the, the dragonflies I'm most familiar with are those who lay their eggs in a pond, and they seem to just drop their egg into... They, they, they drop their behind into the pond and, and release an egg, presumably. Um, how does that work in a flowing water? Because it never occurred to me before. How do, they, how do they do it in a stream to not have the egg uh, carried away? Do they attach it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, that happens. So again, there are multiple strategies. So um, some species, like the ones, indeed, many of the species, especially the dragonflies that breed in ponds, they tend to just uh, drop them uh, in on in the water surface. They drop to the bottom and develop there. In running water, uh, many species uh, have uh, sort of anchors uh, on the eggs, so they'll have like uh, a gelatinous uh, spiral, for example, so something that can catch on to vegetation or even glue uh, to vegetation and uh, all the damselflies um, so you know, remember I said there's this important distinction in the, in the entire group uh, between dragonflies and damselflies all damselflies actually cut openings in vegetation so they have a, a drill like structure the, the females at the tip of the abdomen called an ovipositor and they make a little slit in the vegetation and they put an egg in there so that means that the, the egg is relatively uh, protected and secure uh, in that little slit. So yeah, there's 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 lots of um, there's lots of different strategies there as well. Some species, for example, have a spike with which they position the eggs in the mud under the water surface. And one of the when I think about dragonflies, one of the first things I think about is their just dramatic variation of color. And are there why why are some dragonflies like deep scarlet and some are bright blue what what advantages do those give them um it's the same reason that birds are col- colorful um these are males trying to impress females and trying to impress each other and dragonflies you know much more so than the many other animal groups and very similar to birds are extremely visual and of course, humans are also extremely visual, and so we see and we ap- appreciate that kind of color. But that diversity uh, we see is all, of course, about uh, impressing each other. You, we originally got in contact because you uh, wrote to me uh, to thank me for referencing the Amani flatwing in mm-hmm. in a, in a book. So. It's one of the most endangered, uh, one of the most endangered species in the world. Can you talk about the Amani flatwing for a moment? 
Yeah, because it's not only uh, endangered, but it's also also extremely uh, unusual, in the sense that it seems to be. Um, so just to t- tell uh, you, yeah, a little the, the the listeners a little bit about this species. So this is a damselfly, which is only known. Wait, uh, can from you can, the... can you back up a second? Yeah? and you haven't defined yeah? the difference between a dragonfly and a damselfly. Can you define? Okay, the yeah, difference? sure. Um, so as I said, there are about six thousand species in the order Odonata, the insect order Odonata. There are about six thousand species, three thousand dragonflies, three thousand damselflies. Generally, the dragonflies tend to be a bit more robust. And they uh, tend to hold the wings open when perched. And damselflies tend to be more slender, and they tend to have the wings closed when they're when they're perched. There are exceptions. So if you want to be really sure, what you should look at is this: the dragonflies. The scientific name is Anisoptera, which means Anisoptera means unequal wings. So if you look, the fore wings and the hind wings are different because the hind wings are wider. If you look at a damselfly, the scientific name is Zygoptera. A zygon is a yoke, like, you know, that you would use to carry water, so it's balanced, which indicates that all four wings are balanced. They're all equal. And the other thing you can look at is the eyes. A dragonfly has larger eyes that sort of enclose the, enclose the head, they envelop the head, whereas damselflies, they have slightly smaller eyes, which are at opposite ends of the head. So it's more like with a hammerhead shark. The head is in between the eyes. So um, generally, you can just see it by the position of the wings and by the general slenderness. But if you want to be really sure, just look at those wings and and eye details. So you were talking about the Amani flatwing, and I interrupted you. Yeah. So this uh, is a damselfly that is only known from uh, the East Uzumbara Mountains, which is a, a, a mountain range in Tanzania. And this is a very a part of a very ancient uh, mountain range in Tanzania called the Eastern Ark. And the Eastern Ark has all sorts of uh, animals living there that are found nowhere else in the world. And the, the Amani flatwing is one of those. And at the moment, it's only found, it's only known to be found at one stream. This, is, this mountain range is very densely populated. It's a very lush, uh, very uh, fertile area. So people are also, uh, you know, very comfortable there, just like like the dragonfly, and uh, most of the forest there has been cleared for agriculture. And this species also doesn't go very high up into those mountains, which means, you know, as people encroach from the bottom into the mountains, the forest that disappears first is the forest at the bottom, which is exactly where the species occurs. But what is even more special about this damselfly? It's not just any uh, rare. A damselfly, it's also a damselfly that we don't even know where its closest relatives live. So, for most uh, damselfly species, you would, you know, you would have one species and then the next mountain range you would have something similar. And, you know, there would be a whole family of related species. But with this particular damselfly, we have no clue what its nearest relatives are. It might, you know, we're still researching it, but it might actually be a unique family of dragonfly. So, not only is it is it endangered? But it's also probably represents, you know, it represents an, an, an ancient story. Uh, it's it's like a living fossil. It s- tells us something about what the African environment was like millions of years ago. And so, if we lose that species, we don't just lose a species, but we actually lose a part of evolutionary history of this group. So, uh, you know, that's what makes it special. That's why it was nice that you referenced it. And how many, how many, approximately how many individuals do they think there are of those? And how, how big is their, how much habitat is remaining to them? So the, um, the stream, uh, I'm actually very unfortunate myself. I've actually, I've been to the site, but I've actually never seen, seen the animal because I was there in the wrong time of year. And I tried very hard uh, to find the larvae because, you know, to find the larva would be a, a fantastic way to find out, um, you know, something more about it, about what it's related to because it will give us more information but i couldn't but what you do notice is that it's just a tiny stream it's a small rocky stream it's maybe a kilometer long but probably the section that the species is on is a couple hundred meters and well we have an estimate i think uh, i think you cited it it was something like 500 individuals but the thing is it's almost impossible to know because there is no one out there 
counting these individuals, look, you know, going to look every day in the season when they're flying to see how many are there. And even if someone did, you know, to really know how many species there are, you would have to count how many are emerging from the water, or you would have to do uh, uh, like a, a study marking individuals to see how many different ones there are. So that is, is a very wild guess. Uh, so, so to be honest, you know, there, 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 there could be ten, there could be a thousand. All we know, and you know, we've tried to look for it at, at other streams at higher elevations, but this is the only stream that is in, in pristine forest at this elevation that we know of. So as far as we can tell, it's only there. So I interviewed a couple months ago someone who works on fireflies, and one of the things they're doing in the United States is a – he actually is in charge of this, that he set up – a program where people go outside for 10 minutes and they record the number of firefly, the number and color of firefly flashes that they see. And that is starting to provide a larger database of firefly population estimates and trends. And is there anything even remotely resembling that, any sort of citizen um um, uh, reporting system for dragonflies, or is that even a possibility that something like that could start to be set up? Uh, there's actually a lot of that going on. So um, I would say that 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 I might even you know dare to say that uh, dragonflies are among the insects, the darlings of of citizen science, and that is because they are beautiful, they are popular. Many species are relatively easy to identify, and citizen science has increased in general. There are many websites uh, all over the world, like uh, iNaturalist and iSpot and observation.org, and in South Africa we have the virtual museums that are uh, collecting records, not just of, of, of dragonflies, but of butterflies, of birds, of basically anything we can get. And we see that, that dragonflies are very often a, a target group uh, in these kind of initiatives because they are a group, and especially an insect group and a freshwater group that we can use to, you know, to bring the public in, to draw, to, you know, to draw their attention to nature, and and to observe. And so we are collecting uh, uh, thousands, uh, you know, if not tens or hundreds of thousands uh, of records through all these different uh, po uh, portals. Uh, now, and the problem is actually we, we you know we, we have we're getting more data than than the experts that are working on the dragonflies can handle. So uh, we really hope you know that you know we can we can make the best of of the data we we get and 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 serve the people that are serving us. It's it's it, it's extremely important. It's it's in in a way it's it's become the foundation of dragonfly research. It's the volunteers out there collecting uh, all the records. That's great. Um, I'm going to go a different direction again. And when you were talking about various threats to to dragonflies with primarily dam building and changing the physical structure of, of the stream or pond, um, there's another thing that I've been wondering about just here locally is that is that um, the, the, the pond that I'm most familiar with has m far fewer ha – has fewer um, – frogs in it than there used to be um, because UVB, I'm sorry, the ozone layer, the depletion of the ozone layer allows more UVB through that weakens some of the egg sacs of some of the species and so fewer of the baby and so more of a mold called Saprolegnia gets in and eats the, eats the babies. So that population is going down. And my point is that something I used to see, I used to see just scads and scads of tadpoles, and there are fewer now. And the point is that the dragonflies eat the tadpoles, and we know that amphibians are undergoing just worldwide collapse. And so my question is, um, does, a, does that constitute a significant enough reduction in their prey to also affect the populations of dragonflies? Do you see what I'm asking? I see what you're asking. Uh, as far as I know... Uh no uh, no research has been has been done or any any evidence has been gathered that something like that is happening there is of course a very intricate relationship between dragonfly numbers and 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 frog numbers because yes 
of course, uh, some species of, of, of dragonflies will be, you know, will predate as larvae on, on these tadpoles. But then the adult frogs themselves are also uh, often uh, eating uh, the dragonflies. So there, there, there's a complicated... In a way, if, you know, if there are lower numbers of frogs, that might actually also benefit uh, the dragonflies, or at least some species in, in those ponds. But as far as I know, there, there is no evidence um, uh, to state you know, that there is uh, such, 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 such a relationship. But of course, it, it's very well possible, because... Um, if anything is true about the natural world, it is that we know almost nothing about it, and uh, we know our impact on it is massive, uh, but we don't know how massive that impact is, and we often almost don't care to to know, as as humans, how 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 dramatic uh, our impact is. So, I'm 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 always uncomfortable asking this this question, but it it still seems an important question. And then the question is, and is what what are the we know that, that that dragonflies are predators, and but what happens? What would be some of the effects in terms of an unraveling of a of a forest or a meadow, if if dragonfly populations were to either collapse or to 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 were to change? Um, like I know that salmon are incredibly important nutrient pumps into a forest that they bring in just tons, literally of nutrients from the ocean up to the forest and what are some of the important roles that dragonflies can play in their natural communities like do they and not just for us but for all of them do they do they when they eat do they eat tiny little bugs like um like mosquitoes as well as larger creatures yeah yeah well i mean that's the first thing i can think of so uh dragonflies are indeed old predators and um Typically, yeah, when people um, think of, of possible impacts of having fewer dragonflies around, uh, one of the major ones can be, and I think there's a little bit of evidence. There's actually not as much evidence as you would expect, but there is some there is some evidence um, that this is true, and that is that uh, dragonflies are major predators of, basically, they will eat anything they can get, and that can in, in, include um, uh, mosquito larvae, and uh, so the larvae will eat mosquito larvae, and the adults will eat mosquito adults. And uh, I, I can bring actually an, an example to mind here, which is purely anecdot anecdotal, but um, it was very, uh, very startling uh, to me. And this was uh, a friend who was doing research into uh, malaria mosquitoes in, in South Africa. And the reason why he was, he was, he was actually looking at dra a dragonfly larvae was because he was actually, he was surprised how little uh, people that uh, are, you know, are trying to to deal with ma malaria mosquitoes. How little they actually know about the ecology of these mosquitoes and uh, of their um, and of their predators. So basically, you know, when they have a problem with mosquitoes, they just uh, poison uh, the environment and they think they get rid of the problem. And he thought, well, that's not a very ecological thing to do. So we should actually just be looking at what is happening in the natural system. What are their predators? And so he was uh, going around in South Africa looking at different uh, um, water bodies. And what he found is that either he found a water body completely devoid of dragonfly larvae and packed with, with the mosquito larvae. And often these were, 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 were uh, disturbed or uh, uh, polluted uh, uh, habitats. And, and, and others, he found, uh, like, untouched um, uh, ponds that were full of the dragonfly larvae, and there were no mosquito larvae. So it is, it is very well possible that that is an extremely important relationship, and that that uh, will, uh, you know, that, that, that does benefit us as, as, as humans. So once again, a different direction. Um, when you talked about that migration, is... And this may be a silly question, but are the dragonflies purely individual, or when they when they have a migration, when they move somewhere, are they ever social? Do they do they go en masse, or is it just that they happen to go at the same time? Yeah, I think it's that that yeah. So dra dragonflies are not um, social in the sense that um, you know that bees or or wasps are, are social. So they don't have. A social system in that sense so when you see these migrations you see the migrations happening in swarms 
Uh, but that is because, yes, large numbers of dragonflies emerge at the same time. Uh, all of them have the same problem. All of them are following the same winds. Uh, and so, yeah, they will continue to, to behave in swarms. But I don't think there is, you know, uh, an active mechanism to keep them together. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's that's very interesting. So, what do you see? I mean, you, you you already said that in some places dragonflies are increasing, and in some places they're um, they're decreasing. What is your at least short term prognosis for? What is your feeling about dragonfly populations that you study? Are you I mean, most of the people I know who study anything in the natural world are spend spend most of their time um, fighting despair and fighting depression because things are so bad. I mean, anybody working on salmon is just tearing their hair out 24 hours a day. And are, how are you feeling about dragonflies generically? I would say... It's not the dragonflies per se that I despair about. I mean, obviously, there will be declines, and at the moment we estimate that perhaps uh, one in ten species is, is threatened with extinction. But I sort of try to turn it around and think of what dragonflies mean to me, and what you know why I became interested in dragonflies in the first place and why I do what I do which is basically write field guides and uh, you know make dragonflies accessible to people and initially I was doing that you know I was I was writing these books I was exploring these areas because dragonflies are beautiful and because the places where they brought me are beautiful and then I realized that you know why you know that basically what I was doing was 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 finding a way to to translate and transport that satisfaction to other people so that they could have the same experience so that through the, the you know the beauty of, of of dragonflies that it's undeniable and the sensitivity of dragonflies that it's also undeniable I, you know i realized that they were like a, per, a perfect metaphor of what nature is for us and so then I realized, oh, that's actually why I'm I'm doing what I'm doing. So even though I I do despair, not so much about the individual dragonfly that is declining, but about you know whenever I go, in, in, like in Africa, I work mostly in Africa, and in Africa, things are changing so 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 rapidly. It's it, it it in a way it's sort of it's almost like the last continent that we're going to destroy, and. Um, I see the individual um, moments, uh, you know, of destruction, a new road, a forest that gets cleared, uh, a new dam, whatever. And it's not like I, 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 I then worry about about that one particular population of that one particular species. It's more the general picture. But I then just want to translate my fascination into something, you know, that other people can use and and hope that that you you know through the, the the beauty and sensitivity of that group that i love so much and that i think they can learn to love um that they just you know the people just become a bit more aware and a bit more a bit less selfish um so that, that's how i sort of want to you know want to try, try to turn it around and try to you know try to be try to be positive about it and how can i mean apart from doing what you're doing already or in addition to it how can you and we and all of us help to awaken and how can dragonflies help to awaken that among people every, what do you want people to do to help awaken that sense of love that you have had since you were at least 12 years old for the natural world and specifically for dragonflies how can that help to be awakened go outside and look that's all that's all people need to do people um i mean it it baffles me i i i often so, you know so often you 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 see like children that are so fascinated by you know by the insects that they see in the garden or or the flowers you know they're they and and so often you see that that is lost as 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 kids grow up and go to school and um you know, become 
overly concerned about what people think of them and what they should be doing in the future and you know somehow lose you know they lose that that childlike curiosity and that is basically what what we need to hold on to and we all we all have it in us in ourselves and I think we're all we're all naturalists, you know. In 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 our hearts, we we all evolved, you know, as naturalists, uh, you know, hunter gatherers that needed to know. We needed to know our species. We needed to know how to recognize stuff and 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 to observe it and to know where to find it. And so we all have that in our genetic makeup to to observe and to appreciate that stuff. And and instead of you know, locking ourselves up. All we need to do, basically, is 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 go outside and and maybe get get a little nudge of of awareness from you know from people that write books like like me, uh, uh, or that you know are on radio shows, uh, you know, telling people to open their eyes. But yeah, basically, if everybody has you know takes takes their children out, takes their friends out. Um, and just exposes themselves to nature because yeah it is it is pretty bad out there but there's still so, so much beauty to, to be seen everywhere and in most cases not not too far away and often even in the city and um so in a way you know it's not it's not very hard it's um uh that is just a matter of focusing elsewhere and dragonflies are dramatic but it doesn't really matter i mean there is there is in a different sense, there is that same beauty. I saw it. I saw. I've, I've only. I grew up around grasshoppers too when I was a kid and through most of my life. And it wasn't until I was, gosh, five or six years ago, that I first saw a dragonfly laying laying her eggs. And it was extraordinary. What she did is she dug a little hole, quite like a sea turtle, and then she put her behind down in the hole, her ovipositor, and she she then laid her eggs and then she covered it over. It was it was quite like a sea turtle. It was extraordinary and beautiful. Or, yeah. back to dragonflies, one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life is I sat and watched the entire process of a larvae crawling up a blade of grass and then busting its skin, and then I just sat there next to it for, I don't know, a couple hours, I guess, while its wings unfurled, and then it, they hardened, and then it eventually flew away. No, it didn't fly away. That was in the evening, and it flew away the next morning. But the point is... That's, it doesn't matter whether you're looking at a willow tree or a dragonfly. I mean, there is so much beauty. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. So, so for example, if you would, um, let's say, dig a, a pond in your backyard, you know, maybe you're not doing you know that much for dragonflies per se because you know the species that can breed in your pond are the species that can breed in any pond and they're actually not the species that are threatened but that's not really the reason why you're putting the pond there the reason you're putting the pond there is because you can attract dragonflies to your garden and you can see what you just described you you know you can you can follow the seasons you can see the dragonflies uh, appear you can see uh, the dragonflies arrive if they're if they're migratory species you can see them emerge um, you can see the succession of the vegetation you can see other people uh, sorry other species appear you can see the interaction you can see uh, with with other species with the frogs with um, you know with the mosquitoes all the things we've been talking about you know if 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 you're digging a pond in your garden for dragonflies that is the real reason you know to bring nature a little bit closer to you and and as i said you know the the, the words that you you quoted right in the beginning that is what i like so much about dragonflies it's not about humans it's about nature is so there... they you know sorry yeah no go ahead please no, no, no. I, th I think I made my point. <laughs> so is there anything else you want to say about dragonflies before we end? Um, wow, that's that, that's a very general question. Um, I'm just reminded now of, 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 of one time this dragonfly expert, he... Um, he taken us out uh, in the Alps for, for a few days to, to look at dragonflies. And then we said goodbye and his last words were, dragonflies forever. And um, it was just so random, but so true that uh, yeah, yeah, that is now the first thing that that came up uh, uh, with me. Um, dragonflies forever, nature forever. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. There, so there. Go ahead. 
they're just they're just the most amazing things. They're just the most you know the sort of the the, the perfect expressions of the beauty and sensitivity of nature. You know what I've said now a, a, a few times, and um, so I would like to say to anyone who's listening who hasn't bothered you know to go and sit along a river or by a stream or by a pond just to observe them and just to see how amazing they are and i think that's all i need to say well thank you so much for all that and thank you for your work and i would like to thank listeners for listening my guest today has been kd dykstra this is derek jensen for resistance radio on the progressive radio network